Now let's read God's word in 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25 from verse 14 through 35. David's men have been looking after and helping the shepherds and sheep of Nabal. David then asked Nabal if he will, in a time of prosperity for Nabal, give some food to David and his men. And Nabal says no. Verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a man of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves and two bottles of wine or wineskins and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid them on asses and she said unto her servants go on before me behold I come after you <coughs> but she told not her husband Nabal and it was so as she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill and behold David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. When Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he, Nabal is his name, and folly is with him, for Nabal means fool in Hebrew. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thy handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, that it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offence of heart unto my Lord either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. 
David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. Amen. <clears throat> Let's read together our text this morning. Romans 12, verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is our final sermon on Romans 12, that great chapter on gospel living. We've had 20 sermons on it. I trust, beloved, that you have found Romans 12's teaching on practical godliness illuminating, humbling, and challenging. Now, appropriately, our last text deals with victory. And the Greek word for victory, used twice in this verse, is Nike. I pronounce it the contemporary way, not, not the Greek way. Nike. Victory. That's what it's dealing with. Now, we need to be clear that the Christian, every Christian is a victor or a winner in Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors, more than victors, that Nike word again, through him who loved us, Romans 8 says. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, Nike again, through our Lord Jesus Christ, says 1 Corinthians 15, dealing specifically with the bodily resurrection. You are, though it sounds a bit trite and even worldly, but it's true to say it, you are all winners. No losers in the church. But in this great war, though overall, the big picture, we are victors in Jesus Christ. In individual battles, maybe in quite a number of individual battles, I can't tell, we are sometimes defeated. Though in other ones, we're victorious. The text says, be not overcome of evil. That's a possibility, a real possibility. It's even a fact that we have been defeated. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome of evil with good in those instances we're not just living in the overall victory of the Christian life but in that particular struggle or battle we won by God's grace we were on the right side you see our text is about a contest or a conflict or a battle between the Christian and another party or power with this other party or power being that which has done the Christian ill, really bad ill. So the text uses the word evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And in these day-to-day -day battles, or even hourly conflicts, or maybe you have a whole host in a particular hour, one after another. There is either victory or defeat. You either win or you lose. You either conquer or are conquered 
or to use the word in our King James Bible, you either overcome or you are overcome. And this sort of language, the language of our text, indicates that the believer is a soldier fighting in the conflict for the Lord as a member of the church militant. That's the sort of militancy that we believe in and practice. Let's consider our text under the theme, which is a question, overcoming or being overcome. First, examples. Second, perspectives. And third, ways. Overcoming or being overcome. Examples, perspectives, and ways of overcoming or being overcome. Our first example involves Moses and Aaron at Kadesh in Numbers chapter 20. Israel on this occasion, as on so many other occasions, did evil to these two brothers. They gathered together in a huge mutiny against Moses and Aaron. They attacked their leadership and they accused them of all the implausible and downright stupid and silly things of bringing them into the wilderness with the express purpose of killing them all. There you are. That was what Moses and Aaron were really about all those years. They just brought them into the wilderness in order to kill them. Secrets out. That's what they were trying to do. And then Moses, who was the meekest man on all the earth, Otherwise, he'd have lost his rag years ago with Israel. Moses, the meekest man on the, on the holy earth, even Moses and Aaron cracked. They lost their tempers. They called God's people rebels. There was a lot of truth in that, though. Especially this, that they smote the rock twice to bring out water rather than speaking to it as God had expressly commanded. And then the question is, in the lines of our text, did Moses or Aaron here in these circumstances overcome or were they overcome? Did they win or did they lose? Now, someone looking on from the outside, well versed in the school of the world, would have said they did, they won. This was a display of power. They showed Israel who really was the boss. They reasserted themselves over a recalcitrant people. But the truth is that they didn't win. They lost. And God charged them here with unbelief. You didn't believe me when you did this. And you didn't glorify my name before Israel. The visible sign of their defeat is very obvious. These two leaders were expressly forbidden by God the privilege of leading Israel into the promised land. And Moses, whose prayers ordinarily, as the great mediator, whose prayers ordinarily prevailed with God, this time did not get what he wanted. He tried time and time again. Lord, won't you just allow me into the land? And God said, no, no. Don't ask me that again. You could say that in a sense, Moses and Aaron won because God killed them earlier and took them into heaven quicker. That's true. Overall victory and no matter what. But in this instance, they lost. Our second example involves two women, not two men, Hannah and Penina in 1 Samuel 1. Who wins between these two women? Hannah has kids, lots of them. Han uh, Penina rather has kids, a lot of them. And Hannah has none. Penina then proceeds to rub it in and she reduces Hannah to tears on more than one occasion. And if the ordinary, fleshy man of the world looks on, he says, well, the victor in this contest is easy to recognize. 
It's Penina. She, of the two women, has lots of children. And the other one has the hygiene. Obviously. Obviously, Penina wins. But the Bible teaches that Hannah was the overcomer, to use the terminology of our text. And she overcame because she did not retaliate. She overcame because she prayed earnestly. And the book of 1 Samuel is not named after any of Penina's sons or daughters. And here are parts of Hannah's joyful prayer after she dedicated Samuel to the Lord at the tabernacle. 1 Samuel 2 verse 3. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. People could have made all sorts of judgments regarding these two women. But the Lord was busy weighing the actions of the two of them and indeed of every human being who has ever lived. Verse 7 continues, The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. We believe. We believe in a God who turns things around. The God who turns things upside down. Because his view is almost always determined. Or not determined but recognizable. By being the exact opposite of what the world says. The truth Is the position which nobody holds apart from the believers. Hannah got it. She said, God kills, he exalts, he brings down, he lifts up. Things are not quite what they seem, and God is doing things his way. As a third example, we move to Naboth and his vineyard in 1 Kings 21. Surely, if ever there was a man who lost, it was Naboth. He lost to Ahab and Jezebel. He lost his life. He was stoned outside the city. And that on trumped up charges, as if Naboth, one of the few godly men left in the northern kingdom, actually blasphemed God. Or blasphemed the king. He lost his vineyard. And later scripture tells us. They even lost his sons. Because Ahab had them executed. To make sure nobody else could claim. The heritage of Naboth. The man lost. Total loser. But the truth is. That Naboth actually won. He made a good confession. To Ahab. Of the spiritual significance. Of his land. As a token of his inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth. And in the new creation, Naboth will get his special portion, just as, let's say, Caleb did when Israel conquered the land in the book of Joshua. And even at his death, when the stones were thudding into him, and doubtless they kept on thudding for a while after his spirit left his body. Naboth went to praise the God perfectly whom he had allegedly been blaspheming. And so when you determine losers or winners who overcomes and who is overcome, you need to believe and understand that the eternal perspective is crucial. It's crucial in determining victory or defeat. It's crucial too in enabling us to fight spiritually without retaliating. <clears throat> and so we come finally to 1 Samuel 25, the passage we read earlier. Let's think of it from the perspective of doing good and doing evil. David does good to Nabal, that old ungodly fool, 
So ignorant and rude was he that you couldn't even talk to him. David's men protected Nabal's sheep day and night. And then Nabal did evil to David. He castigated David as if David was a mere brigand in the hills. And he refused to give him any food or drink whatsoever, even though God in his providence, though not grace, had given Nabal great prosperity. And they were even at the sheep shearing here. And even in this great time of wealth, amongst a multitude of wealth, of wealth he, wouldn't, he wouldn't give them a, a loaf of bread. David, in turn then, resolved to retaliate, to do evil to Nabal in return. He swore vengeance. that He would slaughter Nabal and all the males of his household. Sort him out. And so here, at this stage in the story, David has been overcome. Romans 12, verse 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's what David is planning to do. Verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. That's what David was going to do but rather give place or a wide open space unto wrath, the wrath, the wrath of God. Let him take care of it. For it is written, and David knew this too as one who meditated in God's law day and night, though he forgot it in the heat of his anger. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. David was a loser. And then comes Abigail, Realizing what was likely to happen with her husband's churlishness and recognizing too that even David, when provoked, might retaliate. Abigail, Nabal's wise and beautiful wife, comes to David with good advice. She very humbly and extremely tactfully, we read it, you heard it, reminds David that no one is to avenge himself. She reminds him that there's a sure promise of God to David and that he doesn't need to take things into his own hands. So by God's grace, David then goes from loss to victory. His heart is softened by Abigail's persuasive plea. He repents of his vengeful resolution and he moves from venting wrath to utter, uttering blessings. Verse 32. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. He gets it and he realizes what a wonderful thing has just happened in here. That she has come and given him words to stop him from making a horrible mistake. So he blesses God and he blesses her advice and he blesses her. It's striking too that there are some people against whom we are particularly prone to retaliate. 1 Samuel 35, you know, comes between 1 Samuel 34 and 1 Samuel 24 and 1 Samuel 26. What happens in those chapters? David is urged by his men to take vengeance on Saul in chapter 24 and chapter 26. And David steadfastly and righteously refuses. No, I won't touch the Lord's anointed. That's God's prerogative. But in between these two chapters, we have the story of Nabal. And Nabal only wronged David once. Saul did so many times. Nabal simply refused to give David sustenance. Saul tried to kill him many times. And yet David threatened Nabal and his house with immediate slaughter. And he never yielded to that. 
or even the idea of that with regard to Saul. There was something about Nabal and the way Nabal had behaved that got David's goat up. And there are certain people too, beloved, who rub us the wrong way, whereas other people who might even treat us worse than they, we put up with it. But if he does it, or she treats me ill, then immediately we're on the warpath. We think retaliation. And maybe for you, that person, of course, maybe several people in that category, is your spouse. And that's not a good sign. Maybe it's your next door neighbor. And it's quite possible that you have the worst next door neighbor in the world. Hypothetically, it's possible. But, but still. And maybe it's your children. Or perhaps it's even a particular child. Because there's justice and there's correction of your children. But it can't turn into vengeance. And maybe it's none of the types of people I've mentioned. But right now the Lord is reminding you of a person, or maybe a whole slew of people, that you're very prone to get angry with and want to hit back at. And that's not right. Romans 12, verse 17 says, Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And we looked at this text. It means literally, think Literally, it means think before you do anything like retaliation. Think before. So what the sense is, think before about doing things honest and beautiful in the sight of all men, so that not only ought we to act in the fear of God and chiefly have regard to his eye upon us, but we must also think about how this is going to come across and what other people are going to make of it if we avenge ourselves. And so it is that our text this morning helps us to gain the right perspective on our opponent. And right here, right off the bat, is where we make a big mistake which is typically consequences, which leads us into a mess. We think that our adversary is that particular man, her, she's the enemy. For Moses and Aaron, in Numbers 20, it was Israel. Israel was the adversary. They had been behaving badly for years. For David, the name that enraged him was Nabal. That fool. And yet in the other two biblical examples that we looked at earlier, the perspective was different. Naboth was not fixated upon Ahab. And it's even more clearly the case with Hannah. Hannah speaks about the adversaries of the Lord. So Romans 12, verse 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, not even the person who has done you evil, but evil. But overcome evil, not even the person who performed evil on you, but overcome evil with good. And Ephesians 6, verse 12 is even clearer. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, the annoying co-worker, let's say, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood people as such, but against Satan and his demons. That's what Ephesians 6 is saying. And this helps us when we understand that our battle is not merely with that boy or girl or man or woman, but my battle, says the Christian, 
at least he says this when he's thinking biblically with his head on straight, my battle is with evil. My battle is with Satan. You might be fighting against this particular person, but I'm struggling against the demons, says the Christian. And then, once I think biblically and characterize my enemy correctly, that helps me to react in the right way. So if we're battling the principle of evil or the devil, well then there's not much point slashing my enemy's tires. That isn't going to hurt the devil. That's only going to further sin. And our text also gives us not only the right perspective on our opponent, but also the right perspective on victory or defeat. The world determines winners and losers on the basis of what it can see, of what happens in this life, that is, its view of victory or defeat is entirely, from top to bottom, as it always is with the world, earthly. The winner, says the world, is the person who has the last word and who lands the last blow. That's the winner. Cut and dry, dead easy. And we must resolutely guard against this because that was the mistake of Moses and Aaron in Numbers 20 and of the first thoughts of David with regard to Nabal. I did good to him. He did evil to me. I'll have the last word. I'll slaughter him and his whole house. And I'll be the winner. See, he messed with me. I sorted him out. We need to be clear, especially here regarding victory, because there are occasions when a clever retaliation has brought earthly victory. Maybe there's been occasions where we have sinfully retaliated and we actually won. I mean, from an earthly point of view, we won. And, and the lesson we learned from that was not God's providence is strange. We, not, we don't go by providence. We go by what God said is worth. The lesson we learned from that perhaps was, you know what? I'm going to do that again. It worked in the past. I'm going to keep on doing it. There are other occasions in which we think and maybe even we're right, that if we retaliate, there's a fair likelihood of success from an earthly perspective. But even then, we must not take vengeance into our own hands, or, in case there's anybody devious out there saying, well, the pastor said you can't take vengeance into your own hands. If I pay somebody else to do this for me, then it's okay. No, no, no. No evasions, no subterfuge, whether you do it or through some other party, it's still <coughs> vengeance. And you don't do it. And you don't do it even if you think, or even if you knew beforehand, which of course you can't, that you would win in an earthly sense. You still don't do it because it's wrong. We've looked at the right perspectives on our opponent and what constitutes victory or defeat. In short, the issue is whose perspective, in the light of whose thinking, are we to judge this whole issue? Because the world's perspective is, and it's also that of our own sinful flesh, you're a loser if you don't fight back. Don't get mad, get even, and all the other trendy ways of feeding the flesh. But here's God's perspective. Your opponent isn't Mr. X or Mrs. Y. Your opponent is evil. You're battling against Satan and his demons. And victory and defeat are determined by my wisdom, not yours. They're to be understood and can only be understood biblically. And anything outside of that is darkness and sin. And you can call it whatever you want, but it's darkness and sin. And if you are still not convinced... I don't mean intellectually, I mean in part sometimes it's our own upbringing. It's what our friends have told us. We've never analyzed this area in our lives properly before. 
although I would hope that the previous four sermons which have been dealing with this subject have at least whittled away at it or hammered at the, the framework, if you're still not convinced as to what is victory and what is defeat here, I want to show you the ways in which vengeance and retaliation really do constitute losing. Because until we get it into our heads that we're losing, we will keep on sinning and therefore losing. And then we'll boast that we were actually winners, but God isn't deceived. You know that you are losing when you take vengeance or retaliate because you have lost your temper. And if you lose your temper, if you lose your temper, you've lost, right? If you lose a good conscience by sinning, that's losing. If you lose your testimony because of what you did, you can't witness to that person, tell them about Jesus because you know you've just done wrong and they call you out immediately for being a hypocrite. Well, if you lose your temper, if you lose your good conscience, if you lose your testimony, the Lord is telling you, and you surely must get it, I'm losing here. I'm not a winner. I'm losing. And you know, too, that you're losing when through sinful retaliation you end up losing friends. How did you win? You just lost a friend. And I'm not talking about losing a friend because you were faithful to the Lord and that person rejected you for Christ's sake. But you lost a friend. How is losing a friend winning? Or you lose a relationship with a member of family. I'm not now talking about a close relationship, but the person's blood. You want to be able, as verse 18 says, if it's possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. But now you've turned a member of your family against you when you didn't need to. That's losing. You might need that family member later on in life for one thing. And if you lose the goodwill of your neighbors or associates, then you've lost. And you might need that goodwill sometime. And you're only heaping up problems further down the line. Losing. Be convinced it's losing. And you're very obviously losing too and being overcome. When your sinful retaliation leads your opponent to retaliate against you. Or somebody in your family. So you retaliate. You think you've won. In that carnal worldly earthly sense. And then that person hits back at you. What do you expect? You retaliate at him. He retaliates at you. The fighting. The grief. Just keeps on going. How's that winning? And you've also been overcome by your enemy. As Martin Luther points out astutely. It's a nice quote in our bulletin. Because your enemy has now made you like him. See, he or she did evil to you, and now you do it back to them. So, he made you, through your, our, sinful response, like him. That is a transgressor, a sinner, in this regard. His or her sin, therefore, has changed you. That's being overcome by the enemy and becoming like him. Oh, I don't like the idea that I would ever become like him because he's just disgusting and wicked. Well, when you respond in kind, you become like him. You've descended to his level. That's, that's being overcome. That's losing. <coughs> you could say retaliation is losing because it is sinning. And sinning isn't winning. Sinning is always losing. Because if you go this way of retaliation, then you're left with the strange circumstance that you as a Christian have now defined sin as victory. Huh? Sin becomes victory? Really? Where do you get that from? And no matter how it might be dressed up, whether you boast of how you got your own back, maybe that's what's going on with Laban and his murder. And even if others slap you on your back and say, fair play to you, you sorted him out. Even then, your conscience will condemn you. 
And it'll condemn you all the more because of this sermon. And it'll condemn me all the more because of this sermon too. And even if you, we, I boast about it, and everybody commends us for it, you'll feel guilty. You always feel guilty as a Christian. You taste not victory, but defeat. And the taste of defeat, the defeat of sin, is always bitter. It's not sweet. You've lost. And we're called to rise above it. Losing. That's losing. Let me show you now how it's winning, how it's victory, how it's overcoming, not to retaliate. Well, it's overcoming because you have just overcome a temptation. That's overcoming, isn't it? You've overcome because by the grace of God, you have overcome your evil inclinations. That's overcoming. You've overcome your enemy, says our text. You've overcome sin. You've overcome the devil and his demons. There you are. We're taking on the fall of angelic powers and we're even winning in Jesus Christ. We are winning because by the power of the Holy Spirit we obeyed and honoured the Lord. That has to be victory. And that brings us peace. We won because we grew in Christian character. We won because we set a good example to our children. And we showed them that this is not how you react. That this is how you must respond. And maybe too. Victory is seen. And that the person repents and comes to Christ. The Apostle Paul. His conversion may have been provoked in part. By the godly witness of martyr Stephen. When he was stoned to death. And prayed for his enemies. Maybe too there's a little bit of a victory in that when you respond well to a person who treats you badly, a person might feel remorse and maybe he stops abusing you. That's a victory. We'll take all the victories we can get. But even if he doesn't, and even if he actually teach, treats you worse because you responded well, you still actually won. Though though you're going to feel more pain than the person's suffering, the person's inflicting suffering upon you. But that's all right. We just have to bear the persecution in Christ's name and even rejoice. So our calling then, when we are treated badly, to sum up this text and the last five verses of Romans 12, our calling is do not respond in kind. Recompense to no man, not even the biggest sickener in the world, evil for evil. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Don't retaliate. And furthermore, do not allow them to make you bitter in your heart, because even then they've changed you. They put a little bit of sourness into your spirit. Don't allow yourself to be filled with wrath. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't want to be filled with rage or resentment. That's not going to help make any of us a better person. And you must not be possessed of an angry or a vengeful heart. And furthermore, Romans 12 says, do good to your enemy. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And isn't our text saying what Jesus Christ did and did for us? He was not overcome of evil. And there was a lot more evil done to him than all of us put together and cubed. Beelzebub, glutton, drunkard, deceiver, 
false prophet, false messiah. Away with this man. He's, the earth shouldn't suffer a guy like this to live. And they tried to kill him a lot earlier in the cross. His hometown came out one Sabbath to church and thought they were doing God a service when they sought to push him off a cliff and kill him. There were other occasions when they were going to stone him. The Jews rejected him. They cried out for his crucifixion. They said, better have Barabbas, a robber, a murderer, and a rebel than this Jesus of Nazareth. He should live, but Jesus of Nazareth, he must die. And we could go on by speaking about the evil deeds of the Roman soldiers. Jesus Christ was not overcome of all the evil that was heaped upon him. Not once. No sinful retaliation. No inner bitterness. He just went about, said the scriptures, doing good. And surely too, to move to the second half of the verse, here's one who not only was not overcome of evil, but one who supremely overcame evil with good. And he did this even seemingly to his enemies, even his elect enemies, including us. Well, we yet walked in sin. He did good to us. And this is the good that he did for us. Perfect, lifelong obedience to the law of God. Willingly receiving from God's hand the guilt of our sin imputed to him. He was doing us good. And bearing the punishment due to us for our transgressions, especially on the cross. This is overcoming evil with good. Overcoming the evil of the guilt and punishment and pollution of sin. Overcoming the evil of Satan and death and hell. This is victory. The victory that he won for us. The victory that he shares with us. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou bless thy word to us, sinful people who retaliate, who are easily filled with bitterness against those who wrong us, who justify it and justify it to ourselves and to others. Help us, Lord God, to believe these scriptures, especially when we're angry and when we've been wronged, that we may not increase our sins by hypocritically breaking what we've heard about these last few Sundays. Renew us, Lord God. Help us to remember and help us, Lord, to listen to those who remind us of these things when they see us becoming angry or bitter. Overcome, Lord God, our evil natures and renew us by thy Spirit. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs>